Hello there! My name is Brandon and I make pictures out of tiny squares. And in this video I'm going to make a pixel art scene of this cyberpunk juice bar concept. I sketched this one out ahead of time because it was a quick way to work out some of the design choices up front. And this will allow me to focus on translating and detailing these ideas into the pixel art version. So let's get to it! To get started, I'm creating some very basic line work shapes to serve as the foundation for the scene. The canvas size here is 240 by 240 pixels which I'm using because these cyberpunk storefronts are a long time series for me. And that's been the canvas size since the very first one, so I'm continuing that tradition and just keeping them all uniform like that. I honestly can't remember why I had selected that exact sizing in the first place, but either way, uh, something in the mid-200s is kind of right in that 8-bit, 16-bit era sizing, and it's been a comfortable amount of space for this series. The last one I did like this was the coffee shop video that I made last year. And one of the great realizations I had with that one was how well it came together by continuing to work on the rendering throughout the creation of the piece. As opposed to the workflow that I often use where I'll complete all the line work first, and then add shading, and then detail and weathering, etc. Like all in separate rounds. So in this case, as I'm creating the line work and objects, I'm also trying to think about and add any highlights and shading to render those materials and textures. And to also add a bit of grit or weathering at that time as well. The benefit with this approach, uh, what I find for the style of this series anyway, is that it ends up giving a very natural layering to these details, uh, rather than just applying a uniform treatment in a single step later. One of the things that I think really helps for this kind of workflow is having a color palette worked out in advance. So I took some time before recording this to put together the set of colors that you see me using here. I knew I wanted this piece to be dominated by earthy tones, so the main color ramp is that set of greens leading to the dark brown shade tone. And then I've got a yellow and a blue that I'm hoping to parse out as accent colors for some of the focal point items. For those of you with uh, perhaps a discerning eye, you actually may recognize how similar that core relationship of the light tone with the green and the brown is to the Link's Awakening Super Game Boy palette, um, which I'd actually used in a piece a couple months ago. So I don't know if it was maybe still in the back of my mind because you know I ended up here in a similar spot with this selection uh, without planning to. Um, but then here with the addition of the bluish accent color into this set, uh, I thought that would be useful for detailing any mechanical components here. Um, like right here, I'm actually trying to work out sort of what a shiny steel rendering would look like. But I also do find a lot of use with this blue as just a general accent color, like for the roof and some other items that come up here. That's one of the tricks about using pre-selected color palettes though, uh, is that like having a nice hand-picked selection of colors is one thing, but then deciding the logic and the rules for when and how to place them together is something that can go a few different ways, and different artists might look at it differently. Um, with this tree for example, I thought I'd be good to go by just using the main green for the fill color, and then adding some shading to it with the blue. But seeing these two colors together within this large area was just feeling kind of empty. So what I ended up doing was stepping each of these colors down one shade. So the blue shadows became brown, and then the green I swapped out for the blue. And then I started dotting the green back in on top of that, and it looks kind of strange at first, but the more I continued, I really liked how these three were sitting together. And this is one of those things where I probably never would have colored it that way had I not been trying to adhere to this pre-selected set of colors. Um, honestly, I probably would have just gone with like green and then darker green, and then even darker green for those three shades. Uh, but I really like how this color combo works within the context of the rest of the illustration. And it was useful to work out the tree at this phase of the illustration because this little combo set a lot of precedent for how the palette can be used throughout the rest of the artwork. My idea for this tree, by the way, was that it was going to be a bit of a focal point as far as the cyberpunk imagery of this place goes. I like the thought that it may look normal up top, but then the entire trunk is either entirely made of artificial components, um, or to be like a regular trunk that's been augmented with equipment and stuff. So at this point, I'm working to freestyle a lot of detailed technical pieces within the silhouette of this trunk, uh, mostly with the blue and the brown to either convey a mix of either metal and wood or perhaps like a rusted metal look. Since this storefront is a juice bar, I thought a cool idea was that the tree is kind of this self-sustaining source of some kind of fruit that they use in their drinks. So it would have embedded components that keep it nourished and producing, um, but also capable of like automatically harvesting the fruit as well. Uh, there's nothing really blatantly obvious about that in the final piece, like I didn't want to just have something super on the nose like a conveyor belt with a bunch of lemons rolling down it or something like that. 
Uh, but generally, it was that narrative of the self-sustaining tree that drove a lot of the overall design decisions here. So this idea was finished off uh, with some hanging wires coming from the tree canopy. And then I also wanted to introduce some more organic elements to it. So at the base, I've dotted in a bit of foliage. Um, these ones don't really have any strong outline like the other objects in the scene because I think it helps them feel a bit smaller and flimsy and just kind of allows them to sit as part of the environment. Now that those core elements of the building and the tree are in place, um, we're up on the roof now adding in some decoration that's going to fill in that space between them. Up front is going to be a sign for the shop uh, where I've just sized it out to include a simple bordering and then some blank placeholder lettering that can be detailed later. Uh, layered around that are some other simple shapes to create a bit of coverage and depth up top uh, because then towards the back I wanted to create another focal point for the piece uh, which is going to be this large glass dome um, that's kind of a, a reservoir filled with juice. Uh, I know this doesn't make much practical sense uh, but I think it'd be fun to animate a swirling or blending type of motion for the liquid in there and that whole imagery just provides a good tie-in with the theme of the shop as well. A lot of the shapes and layering here were taking cues from the rough sketch, uh, which, you know, it was made without these finer details in mind. Uh, but even so, it just gave me a reference for what the overall silhouette could be. And the rest just sort of fell into place around those central components. Probably one of the best examples of that was this little circular object off to the side of the roof. Uh, I didn't have anything in mind, like, exactly during the rough sketch phase. Uh, maybe like a spotlight or something. But more importantly, I just like the silhouette of it sitting right there. So here I'm just improvising a few options for that one, and eventually I settled on a sphere-like design that I thought looked a bit like a globe or something. And it's just kind of a neat addition against all the other pieces. The last major set piece is this street lamp off at the left side. And this is another one where I'm just getting in a basic structure first, and then having a bit of fun decorating and layering things onto that. I've tried to work with the existing composition here by putting those angled panels above the angle of the roof. And then toward the base there are a few different elements to occupy some of that in-between space. On the light panels, I've stepped through the gradient from white to green to blue. And that gives it a sort of gradual broken outline that works a bit better at conveying kind of a soft lighting effect, rather than if this were left as a full dark outline. With all the main structures worked out, I'm doing a lap around the full piece now to fill in areas of details and, you know, some of that lettering that I passed on making decisions about earlier. Um, like I said before, I was trying to render in detail as I went along. And for the most part, I got everything into place as it was being illustrated, but there's always room for a second pass. Um, you know, once your eyes get used to a certain level of rendering, sometimes you can think like, well, I think I can go heavier with it, you know? Um, I'm sure if you scoured my videos, actually, there'd be conflicting statements of me saying, you know, it's good to have some areas of visual rest and other times where I'm just like, I'm not going to stop until every blank space is filled. Um, so clearly that's a sliding scale depending on what I'm working on. But for a piece like this, I have a lot of fun exploring the environment and just tucking in a lot of detail where I can. Anyway, uh, some of this final detailing, of course, includes populating the scene with some characters. Uh, the first being the shop owner. And as is tradition with the series, uh, it's a robot. And for this one, I've gone with a mono eye design and he's wearing a green apron. And the other two characters are my cats <laughs> based on my in real life cats. And at this point, they're the easiest to add because I just use the same sprite work. Um, the only matter of decision here is like where to place each one within the scene. And I usually choose that pretty carefully. All right, and it's now time to add a bit of animation to the scene. And I'm starting this one with the spinning juice within the reservoir because I thought that was going to be the thing that may require the longest set of unique frames to make. Um, in fact, I was actually prepared for this to take up to 24 frames. I thought it might need that much to get like a really smooth swirling motion. But after making the first six frames, I realized that this motion actually needs to occur pretty quickly, um, which is sort of obvious now. But um, if it were to take too many frames, uh, it has the wrong kind of physics. It'd be too slow. So from those initial six, I uh, just sort of mirrored those to generate 12 unique frames. And basically what's happening here is that each set of six uh, is kind of going through a small wave that's cresting on one end of the tank and then kind of settling and shifting towards center. So this is just the first draft of the animation. It's a little bit choppy or whatever, uh, but because that main color is quite light, uh, what I've done here is I'm playing with a partial outline on this one to act as a bit of shadow that uh, can sort of catch your eye and convey that transfer of motion. 
Over at the cyber tree, I'm creating some moving pistons that I'll be firing off. And to do this, I've separated those out from the background and I'm placing them underneath the rest of the tree. Um, by layering it like this, I can move that full piston up and it just gets covered up by the layer above it, which is nice because it's a lot faster to simply change the position of a piece like this um, than if you were to have to redraw one for every frame of the animation. Also, when the pistons shoot up, I've got one frame where the brown pixels that are shaded underneath them kind of lag behind and fill that space. And that's sort of my concession for having a smear frame, uh, something that'll give it the effect of motion blur. I figured I couldn't smear the entire piston because it's already colored in these vertical stripes. So to just stretch that pattern out as a blur when it moves up would have just looked like it was in the starting position anyway. I'm creating a rotation for the little globe object. And to do this, I'm actually just animating the position of the blue grid pattern within it. That'll provide the point of reference to actually be able to notice that it's rotating. Um, without that, you could probably also get by with bouncing the shadow, uh, if it has a shadow. But this one is pretty small, so I just stuck with the rotating pattern. I kept a lot of the other animations quite simple, um, like just blinking lights and stuff like that, because I didn't want this to come out super busy with motion, um, since it was feeling like a pretty serene vibe so far. So uh, with that, let's just go ahead and take a look at the final art for the Cyberpunk Juice Bar. Here we go. All right, and if I may just mention real quick, I've actually added this one as a print in my shop, and I've got a few others from this series there as well. They're all available as high quality art prints, and there's also a more budget friendly photo print option. So if you're the kind of person who likes physical prints like that, uh, I've left a link to those down below. And we'll just roll right on through to close out with some CRT time, um, which I don't know if it was the colors here or maybe the camera and TV were just having a really good day together, uh, but I thought this footage came out quite well. Uh, so let's check that out. And thank you for watching and take care and keep it square.